Seymour Hirsch is the man who made two American presidents, 30 years apart, choke over their breakfast. Richard Nixon and George W. Bush opened the newspapers to find that Hirsch had broken the stories of two of the biggest military scandals in American history. In 1969, Seymour Hirsch uncovered the fact that a young American soldier, Lieutenant William Kelly, had led the massacre of 109 civilians in the Vietnamese village of My Lai. That report made Hirsch famous, and over the next 30 years he wrote books and articles about American foreign policy, before reporting a more recent war scandal, as horrific as the My Lai incident, the torture of prisoners by American troops at Abu Ghraib jail in Iraq. But though his New Yorker reports on the aftermath of the Iraq attack have brought him more acclaim, Hirsch now has to face the fact that investigative journalism has little effect on the Bush administration. They own the airwaves, they own the battlefield, and all we're just sort of midgets throwing stones at them. I talked to Seymour Hirsch in Washington about the methods and ethics of reporting and whether modern politics has succeeded in freezing out the media. If we start with the simplest question of all, why are you a reporter? Uh, the answer I give isn't the right answer, but it's technically correct because I had failed out of law school and there was nothing else to do and it seemed attractive. I, did, I, wasn't a, uh, I didn't study journalism, I didn't write. I didn't even know I could write until I actually applied for a job as a newspaper clerk. I said my first job was as a copy boy after graduating from college. And so that's one of the answers. I mean, that's the simplest answer. Um, the other answer is um, uh, somehow, maybe for some psychological reason, I like why well, I'm an investigative reporter, that is, report on the bad deeds, probably not for noble reasons, probably because I like making, making other people look bad or digging up dirt or something like that, some complicated psychological reason that I'm not tampering with. In the Second World War, there was a clear belief that there were some stories that should not be reported, particularly in Britain, um, because it would affect the war effort. That was something that journalists, broadcasters were asked to take note of. Should that be an issue for journalists? Second World War was, you could almost argue, the last just war, really. The last war which made sense. You had a, a wonderful bunch of villains. Um, in this war, there are things I haven't written. For example, obviously now people contact me all the time. Uh, even soldiers, you know, in, in Iraq, you just, you have email, you have, you can, you can call 800 numbers, you can have phones, you can really, you can be in communication with soldiers in the middle of all sorts of hell, actually. What I get sometimes, um, I get photographs of terrible events, and, and often I don't write about it because often, in one case in particular, a group of GIs terrified in a country that they don't know the language, all they know is everybody's against them, and their fear is so palpable, you can even see it in the casual TV and, and, and uh, fo newspaper photographs. Um, a, ro a bomb goes off, they jump out of their Humvee or whatever it is, start spraying bullets. In this one case, they shot up a bunch of boys that they thought were running, but they were running because it was a nearby soccer game. And after they killed a bunch of them, the terrified soldiers dragged them together and then dropped some what they call RPGs, uh, rocket propelled grenades, dropped weapons among them to make it look as if these teenage boys, and they weren't wearing shorts, many of them, but they were wearing short, shortish pants, uh, sports clothes, uh, make it look as if they were terrorists. And one of their crowd filmed it all and sent me the, uh, by email, you know, sent me these, these digital photographs. And the more I thought about it, the more I looked at it, doing that story would have, uh, they didn't commit murder. They, they committed the inevitable mayhem of war. And, and it's the kind of, it's the, it's the war's cost that most Americans, I'm sure nobody in our White House really understands. You know, people get killed for no reason. So I didn't do that story. That's the kind of story you don't do. Other than that, no. 
But only the most gung-ho five-star general would suggest that Hirsch should have kept quiet about the two military scandals that frame his reputation. The massacre at My Lai in Vietnam in 1969, and 35 years later, the torture of prisoners at Abu Ghraib jail in Baghdad. If we talk about the, the two biggest stories I think you've been involved in, uh, Me Lai, now it was a, a tip-off from a lawyer. That's how you got onto that story. It was a lawyer who was connected to the anti-war movement. And at that time, in 1968-69, there were thousands of GIs fleeing the war. You know, and uh, running AWOL and running and being deserters, deserting the army. And many, if you remember, there was a lot of stories at the time. They went up to Canada, and there were thousands of GIs living there. So there was an underground. And somehow in the underground, the story became known. And a lawyer, he's now, his name is Jeffrey Cohen. He's now dean of the, uh, a dean at, at the University of Southern California. Um, he heard about it and then told me it was just a tip. I was a freelance writer. And... I think people thought I might really do something with that information rather than just disregard it. It turns out many journalists had heard something about the My Lai massacre, but did nothing about it. Right, which raises a very important question. Why had they done nothing? Uh, I like to think self-censorship. I like to think also they were discouraged by newspapers and editorials. I was terribly discouraged. Once I got the story, once I found Lieutenant Kelly, I literally went off sort of quixotically looking for him. And once I found this lieutenant, and it was very shocking to find him. I built him up in you know, this mass murder. He killed 111 people. The document I mentioned, the Army charge sheet I, I'd seen before I found him. I hadn't even know really who to look for. And he was stationed, hidden in a base in Georgia, Fort Benning, Georgia, an Army base. And so once I get the guy and meet him, it's a real disappointment. He's about five foot six or so, very slight, almost translucent skin. You could, almost, you could literally see the blue veins. And we sat, we, I didn't meet him, catch up to him until late at night, and we drank some beers, and he went to the bathroom uh, to urinate or whatever. And instead, I saw him, the, the, the door was open, there was a mirror. He, he retched blood, he threw up blood. He had an ulcer, must have a huge ulcer, pure red blood he was throwing up. And he was so tense, he hadn't displayed any of it. And you come to realize, by the time I got done writing two books about Me Lai, and a lot of stories, I, I concluded that the kids who did the killings, the American soldiers who did the terrible murders, 550 people or so, were as much victims as the people they murdered. I have the same sort of thoughts about Abu Ghraib. It's more complicated, but it's the same issue. Wrong war, wrong time. Well, I was going to ask you exactly that, because there is, there's a circularity um, to your career, because the stories are so similar when we get to the Abu Ghraib. There is a similarity between them. Well, one thing, obviously, is in the, in the Milai case, the only people prosecuted were the lesser people. None of the senior officers were charged. They all eventually were censored, but they weren't criminally charged. They suffered publicly, uh, eventually. Uh, a two-star general was demoted, et cetera. But nobody was put in jail. Kelly was the only one prosecuted for criminal offenses. Oh, well, one or two others, but basically, he spent a few days in jail, and then the, then the president pardoned him or released him. And in Abu Ghraib, you have the same phenomenon. You have now eight enlisted men, and are, are certainly guilty of incredibly stupid behavior. Um, they've been found guilty, but they were doing what they did for three or four months in this prison in Iraq, um, September through January of, September, October, November, December of 03 into 04, and they were only stopped on one of their own, one of the GIs with them. The enlisted men turned them in, turned in the cassette with photographs, and at that time, every single officer in the Army Command, including the General Sanchez, the three-star officer in charge of the war, visited the jail. There were officers all over the place, and they're the only people charged. So you have the same sort of situation. In other words, I would argue that Bush wins on this one because we've never fixed responsibility beyond the eight. The relationship between investigative reporters and politicians has never been warm. But under the Bush administration, there's been a really big chill. More worryingly for the press, there's increasing evidence that journalism has little effect on politicians or voters. What startles a lot of people, I think, is that the Abu Ghraib pictures go around the world. There was understandable horror. You and others have written about this, and yet Bush 
is re-elected with a quite handsome majority. What happens there? Is that... Well, obviously, I've been thinking about this a lot because um, uh, I don't think it's good for America or the world that he's re-elected. I think it's, and we're going to see. I mean, this, given this man with a free hand is really going to be interesting. Um, you have to blame the candidate. Kerry was a terrible candidate. He didn't do the job. He didn't project. He didn't demonstrate any difference. He waffled on a lot of key issues. In the convention, he decided to play the soldier. And um, uh, so I, I, I think there was enough there in the record. I think journalism failed pretty badly after 9-11 in the first three or four months in the build-up to Iraq. I think all of that could be qual qualified as one of the worst failures of American journalism. But once we got into the campaign and after Abu Ghraib, a lot of things were eased up. It somehow, Abu Ghraib actually led to, I was surprised that I, there was an awful lot of American uh, the American press did a good job on Abu Ghraib. They understood how, how important it was. And they understood that you just can't have this kind of mysterious event come out of nowhere. There has to be much more to it. In other words, what happened in Abu Ghraib was just a, a symptom of a, of a malaise, a really a, a terrible illness. And um, that all was clear. And if you remember, Kerry never mentioned Abu Ghraib in the campaign. It's amazing to me. He just chose not to because I guess he thought that wasn't the way to go. Is there, though, as some people argue, a more fundamental problem for journalism and broadcasting? Just before coming to see you, I watched a news bulletin. Now, the first two stories were the White House says that Osama bin Laden is collaborating with Iran in order to attack America. The second one was the Pope is talking and exercising and much, much better. Now, it suddenly struck me I have no earthly way of knowing whether either of those stories are true. It, it could suit the White House and Vatican to have those two stories out there, or they could be true. It is a problem, this, isn't it, that to establish the truth, whatever that means, is harder than ever before. It's particularly a problem with these guys, because these guys, this guy in the Bush administration, to a degree, never before, other administrations have talked about what we call strategic deception. Um, your MI6 is wonderful because it just lies in country all the time. You know, you have the same sort of agitpro propaganda operations in England going on all the time. But we have them too now. We have a government that now, particularly in the Pentagon, that systematically puts out misleading information to the press and gets accepted. For example, the, the uh, alleged intercept of <laughs> Zakari and, and, and bin Laden. Yeah, okay. I, 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 for one, am always very skeptical of our great ability to intercept and the great ability we have to know what's going on inside uh, the uh, insurgency or the resistance, as I'd like to call it, in, in Iraq. And yet, well, my government has absolutely never has, and as far as I know, will not in the foreseeable future have any advanced intelligence on what's happening there. We don't know when the resistance is going to strike. We don't know where it's going to strike. We don't even know who it is, wh where it is. And yet we're able to magically come up with all these wonderful documents. It doesn't wash. But what, what is reporting to do in the face of that? kind of politics? Oh, that's a hell of a question, because um, the problem you have is that the, 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 the core, the rotten core, which is the willingness of this administration to put out misleading intelligence or information to the American press corps, isn't really known. I think one of the big elements is, for a lot of people in the, you know, there are polls being done today showing that a large percentage of the American people, not 50%, but over 40%, still believe that Osama bin Laden was, um, uh, was connected to uh, uh, Saddam Hussein, that they had a relationship, that the Iraqis had something to do with 9-11, those great tragedies, and still believe that the um, terrorism, that Saddam Hussein was directly connected to terrorism. All these polls show this. Why? Because if you don't, if you want to vote for Bush, you can't know. You can't make yourself know what's going on. So in a funny way, we in the press were stuck with a l dozens of millions of people that simply were inured to the news. They didn't want to know, because if they knew, if they knew what go was going on with WMD and the lying and the misrepresentations, they couldn't vote for somebody they wanted to vote for. Because, and so they just didn't learn. That's why the polls, I think, are screwed that way. This is my guess. So I'm not even sure where we fit in this. We have a government that's completely beyond our can. We can't change them. It's very interesting. And we can't change the people that want to support them.